lot of people were surprised that you slipped down the board to the Ravens. As you saw the draft unfolding, I'm sure you were a little disappointed that you didn't go in the top 10, but did it make you feel better that you did fall to the Ravens and their defense? Yeah, and that's kind of what I was just saying, like, looking back on it. Um, I mean, it may feel or seem like a big deal now, but, I mean, I think I fell into the perfect place, perfect situation, and um, honestly, it's, it's a blessing, and um, I'm just excited to be here. Kyle Hamilton slid to number 14. Could be one of the best players in this draft if he lives up to his potential at the safety position. The Ravens know a thing or two about having great safeties. Peter knows a thing or two about what the Ravens did, especially on Saturday. Round four, an all-important round for the Ravens. They strategized. They specifically engineered. They knew there would be a lot of talent there. They got maximum picks there. Sounds like it was an interesting couple hours for you in the draft room. Mike, a couple of things about this. When I was getting ready to cover the draft this year, I said, man, it's not a real sexy draft, not great quarterbacks, not really a lot of big stars per se in this draft. But what there was, was there was some real strategy by some teams to say, we're going to trade back and we're going to try to maximize our value like in the third and fourth rounds. And you say, well, why is that? In 2020, the COVID football season in college football, there were fewer good players that came out in the 2021 draft. It was kind of a bare bones draft. But this year, it wasn't great at the top, but there was a lot of make it players in the middle of this draft for a lot of teams. The Ravens got six picks and I arranged with them to sit in their draft room to witness how they would use their six picks. So... The first three came off the board perfect for them because they wanted coming into that day, Daniel Fa'alele, the tackle from Minnesota, Jalen Armour Davis, the corner from Alabama, and Charlie Kolar, a tight end from Iowa State. But this is where it really got interesting. You say, wow, look at that. They took a punter at 130. Why did they do that? And the reason that they did it is that they had information that both Tampa Bay and Cincinnati were interested in punters right after them. Tampa Bay, in fact, took a Georgia punter. The Bengals didn't take a punter, but they had heard that Jordan Stout was going to be picked soon after them. So they picked him. And naturally, they would second guess this when eight picks later that the Pittsburgh Steelers took the receiver that the the Ravens were going to take it 139. With pick 138, the Ravens took Calvin Austin the third. When that pick came through the tinny little speaker sitting on the Ravens draft desk, Pittsburgh Steelers pick number 138, select Calvin Austin the third, receiver Memphis. The first thing you heard from one person in the crowd at the Ravens was, you got to be effing kidding me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what was, but what was really interesting, Mike, is right at that moment, I looked at Eric DaCosta, the GM, Ozzie Newsom, who's still in the draft, even though now he's a executive vice president slash consultant, and uh, John Harbaugh. I looked at them and there was no emotion. There was no throwing of pads. There was no all bleepity bleep. There was nothing of that. They just said, okay, let's figure out what we're going to do. And we're going to go with Isaiah Likely, the tight end from Coastal Carolina, asking scouts, okay, you guys okay with this? Yeah. Asking Greg Roman, do you have a spot for Likely? They had just taken another tight end. Yeah, I like him. Let's do it. So they took him. And I got a lot of reaction from this in my story from people who say, Oh, the Steelers trumped the uh, uh, the Ravens, which they did. It's a cool story. Oh, the Ravens were unprepared. They should never have taken the punter. They could have done. And so here's what I say. Do you think that this doesn't happen in every draft room every year? That some team is getting prepared to take John Doe and the team right before him says, we'll take John Doe? It happens every year with almost every team. And so this was the Ravens year. They wanted the Calvin Austin speed. 
to replace uh, Hollywood Brown and they don't have it, you know what? They'll figure it out. But it was a cool experience. And I think in retrospect, Mike, I'm really glad I did it because it really kind of showed the inside football of the painstaking approach to a middle round of the draft. It really is fascinating in many respects. And you're right. In every draft room, at some point during that three-day process, you're going to have a team not get the guy they want. And it's going to happen sometimes five picks before, sometimes one pick yeah. before. That's just the way it goes. And that's why you go into it with enough names so you can live – you know, you've scouted enough guys – you, you, you hopefully never get to the point where you're just saying, well, I don't know who the hell to take next. And, you know, that was always the issue. I don't, I don't mean to go too far off the rails here. When the Bengals of 15 to 20 years ago were drafting guys with real off-field issues in like round three, four, and five, that was because they didn't know who else to take because they didn't have a real scouting department. They just told their assistant coaches after the season ended, let's go figure out who we're going to draft. They would get to the point where, we don't know, this guy was supposed to be a first-round talent, let's just take him, and they didn't know who else to take. The, the good teams will have more than enough names. If a guy that's on their list is gone, they'll pivot directly to someone else like the Ravens did from Calvin Austin to Isaiah, Isaiah Likely. And you can't afford to get bogged down. It's moving too fast. You can't be emotional. You can't, you can't get upset. And you just have to accept there will be guys. There will be guys you don't get. And you celebrate the ones you do get, and you don't worry about the ones you don't. That's, that's the one thing that I really learned from that process. And Mike, what was really interesting is that I wake up Monday morning and I have a text from an NFL general manager who texted me and he said, I was, I was like frozen when I read what you wrote about the Ravens. Because how crazy is this? I was waiting until the Ravens picked at 130, at 130 when they picked Jordan Stout. I was waiting. When that pick got announced, I was going to hit send on a text to Eric DaCosta. And he detailed that he was going to send this text because he wanted the 139th pick from the Ravens. He was going to take Jordan Stout the punter from Penn State. And he said, so he said, I was so ticked off when, when they took it. And I, and I wrote him back and I said, do you get uh, overtly ticked off? Do you, do you really get angry? He says, no, you can't afford to. You can't show the people in your draft room that, oh, woe is us. We missed out on this guy. So he said, that part of it that you wrote that, all of the Ravens guys were just, eh, business as usual. That's the draft. He goes, I do that every year because we always lose somebody we wanted. And I never show my scouts or anybody on our staff that we're disappointed because then everybody's going to think, oh, man, we got screwed. So I think that was a good lesson to take from this whole process. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.